Welcome everyone to our bi-weekly Noontime Berman Institute of Bioethics seminar series. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone filing in. Um, we will have um, an exciting speaker for everyone today and we'll be doing our usual format where we have about 45 minutes or so for a presentation followed by 15 minutes of discussion. Um, my colleague, Travis Reeder, is joined today to introduce today's speaker and help moderate discussion. So thank you, Travis. Um, and I just would invite anybody to, to offer comments or questions as we usually do using the Q&A uh, module or chat window if you'd like at any point during the, the presentation and we'll follow them and track them and um, offer them for discussion during the discussion time. Um, so with that, let me just thank Elizabeth Barnes for joining us today on behalf of the Berman Institute and um, hand over to Travis for a bit of an introduction. Over to you, Travis. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Um, so yes, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today. I'm going to do a short introduction and the rest of the time is going to be yours. So Dr. Barnes is a professor of philosophy at the University of Virginia in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. Her research interests are divided between metaphysics, social philosophy, feminist philosophy, and ethics. She is particularly interested in the places where these topics overlap. She has written a book on disability and is currently writing a book about the nature of health. She also thinks a lot about the metaphysics of social structures. And I will just say that uh, part of why I was really excited that we were able to get Dr. Barnes to come and speak to us today is because uh, her work on disability has been incredibly influential and uh, I teach a little bit on disability every year, and I've started incorporating work from uh, a few of her articles and her book in particular. And it's been clearly influential on my students because I've now had multiple graduate students write their thesis on um, the, uh, the, the mere difference view of disability, which I don't know if you'll say anything about, but I won't steal your thunder. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a very cool, very provocative and compelling thesis. I'm really excited to have Dr. Barnes here to chat with us. And the title of her talk today will be Disability and Health, A Complicated Relationship. All right. Um, so first of all, um, apologies. I appear to be having internet problems today uh, for uh, reasons that are not entirely transparent. So um, if I freeze or otherwise get disconnected, I might just end up turning off my video. Um, but um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for being here, for listening to me talk. Um, I don't know uh, how you guys are doing this Thanksgiving week, but I am uh, feeling tired. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to screen share. I'm not doing anything fancy. I am just going to chat and uh, hopefully uh, this will be of uh, some interest and I'm going to keep it relatively informal, relatively relaxed um, and uh, and uh, hopefully we, we can find some things to chat about. So um, uh, the again, what I'm uh, going to be talking about today is uh, the complex and uh, somewhat vexed uh, relationship between disability and health. So particularly what I'm interested in, so a lot of my um, work in philosophy on disability has been about um, articulating and giving justifications and arguments for a view of disability that is extremely common and increasingly common within the disability rights movement. Um, and that is what I've called a, a mere difference view of disability. And it's a view that says that um, disability might be something that um, makes your life harder. It might be something that makes your life uh, different in significant ways. It might be something that maybe negatively impacts you with respect to you know, particular aspects of your life or you know, particular parts of your life. But on the whole, it doesn't automatically or intrinsically um, reduce your well-being. So that disability is something that makes you different, but doesn't by itself um, make your life worse. Um, and you wouldn't automatically be better, say, if you had not been disabled or if someone was able to remove your disability. Um, and in this way, disability is more similar to other minority features like uh, queer sexuality um, or things like that than it is to uh, things that we think automatically negatively impact 
your well-being. Um, and so like I said, um, called this view a uh, mere difference view of disability, and this view of disability is incredibly common within the disability rights movement. Um, and it's something that I think for a lot of disabled people who, who come to this is rel relatively resonant of their own experience um, and is something that has been politically very uh, useful and effective for a lot of disabled people. Um, but what I want to talk about today um, is a difficult aspect of this kind of view of disability, and that is the relationship between disability and health. Um, because what I think is, a, a, I hope is fairly transparent to most people, I would assume is fairly transparent to most people um, in, a, in the disability rights community is that we, no one wants to defend a mere difference view of health. Um, no one wants to say that it's neither better nor worse for you to be made unhealthy, that health itself is not valuable. Um, you know, it, I think, uh, this isn't a hard sell in the middle of a of a global pandemic that health is important um, and it's uh, you know you're not made merely different if someone makes you unhealthy and I think um, that's not just a sort of uh, somewhat obvious thing to say but it's also a, it's a very morally important thing that we'd be able to say that um, health disparities are uh, bad for people and that it's one of you know the major negative consequences of uh, socioeconomic inequality um, that we find health disparities it's one of the major bad effects of uh, global warming and you know environmental degradation that we're looking at, at increased health disparities you know but, um, harming someone's health is a way of harming a person and uh, and health is uh, is valuable. Um, and what we see, obviously, um, when we're looking at disabilities is that um, disabilities have a non accidental correlation to reduced health. Um, obviously lots of ways of being a minority in the world um, involve uh, populations that are in fact health disparity populations. Um, but more often than not, this correlation appears to be socially contingent. You know, it's um, true that black Americans are less healthy than white Americans, but it's almost certainly the case that black Americans are less healthy than white Americans um, because of, uh, racial discrimination and um, you know, structural racism. And if we could get rid of structural racism, there might be some health differences between black Americans and white Americans. It might be the case that white Americans are more likely to get skin cancer and black Americans are more likely to suffer from vitamin D deficiency, but you would not see a radical health difference between black Americans and white Americans if we lived in a fairer world. Um, but it's almost certainly the case that even if we lived in a fairer world, um, there would be, health differences between the group of people we label disabled people um, and the group of people we label non-disabled people because part of what it is to be disabled involves conditions that in and of themselves reduce your health. Um, and so there is this tension in the kind of position that the disability rights movement is um, defending. And so I'm particularly interested in whether it might, whether and to what extent it is possible to um, offer some kind of a translation or a reconciliation between the kind of things that people in the disability rights movement say um, and the natural positions, the typical positions that are going to be held by um, physicians or, or uh, people who work in public health, because I think typically these have been groups that have a hard time talking to each other. Um, so a, a great example, um, I think just last week, the FDA approved um, the first uh, treatment for uh, achondroplasia, the most uh, common form of dwarfism. Um, and I have several friends who are um, very active in the Little People Association of America and they're um, themselves uh, people that are affected with various forms of dwarfism. And they were really, really, really upset about this. Um, they feel like it's an assault on their community. They feel like it's devaluing people like them. They feel like it's something that um, is uh, like, in and of itself uh, ableist to say that people like them might need to be cured. 
Um, and this is something that, that, that their community is quite up in arms about. And then um, I was speaking about this to a, a physician that I know, and he was just, he was baffled by this. He's like, what, <laughs> how, it, you know, a chondroplasia is, it's, it's pathology. Why would, you, why would you not treat pathology? You're a physician, you treat pathology, that's what you do. Um, and so I think that both of these perspectives make a lot of sense. Um, and what I want to try to talk through is how it might be the case that they both make sense. Um, and how they both might be legitimate perspectives um, when we're talking about the connection between disability and health. Um, because these are obviously groups that, that have a hard time talking to each other. Um, so first things first, um, what are we talking about when we talk about disability? One of the things that you notice um, is that the term disability means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. Um, it's striking that it's um, a lot of times in biomedical context, disability just means something like morbidity, right? It just means functional limitation um, or something like that. And so disability is something that, you know, that comes in degrees. You can have a more or less like degree of disability or greater or lesser amounts of disability. Um, whereas in a lot of the context that we're talking about, like the disability rights movement, to have a disability is to have a condition that marks you out socially in a particular way. It marks you out as somebody that people think, oh, right, you live your life in a different way. You go about um, your life um, in a different way. You have to like access spaces differently, or you have to um, arrange your day differently about the, you know, the needs of your body, or you require accommodation, or you require certain extra like, you know, caregiving needs and things like that. That's what we're talking about when, when we talk about disability. So it's having a particular condition that marks you out as being physically different in a striking way that then, you know, um, affects how you live your life on an everyday basis. Um, so a lot of people that might have like some degree of disability in a biomedical sense wouldn't identify as disabled in a broader social sense, wouldn't, you know, show up at the disability rights movement organization. Uh, I think it's also important to, um, point out that a lot of times the conditions that we're talking about when we're most interested in talking about the connection between disability and well-being um, or disability and health and a lot of times the um, conditions that we're talking about what might be you know compatible with a fully flourishing life or um, the kind of things that don't necessarily make your life go worse, you know, the, the, the characteristic uh, claims of mere difference, more often than not tend to be physical disabilities. Now, not always, sometimes um, people do make these claims. I mean, certainly some cognitive disabilities like autism, the autism acceptance movement also um, makes very similar claims. Um, it gets more complicated when we talk about psychological disabilities, because there is a connection to rationality so it's it, it it becomes more complicated when people are talking about their own lives but certainly like i i don't i don't think anyone um in the disability rights movement thinks that like it's uh it doesn't reduce your quality of life to like i don't know have an eating disorder or <laughs> be suicidal or something like that like that's these these are things that they just seem universally terrible to have um and people seem to agree to that we're talking about the more like paradigm instances of physical disability, like loss of a sensory modality or a spinal cord injury or a chondroplasia or, you know, these kind of things. Um, and people are making the claim that they are, um, that they should be destigmatized um, and that they are fully compatible with, um, not only fully compatible with a flourishing life, but don't necessarily make you worse off and you wouldn't necessarily be better off if you didn't have a condition like that. Um, so, I think there's a couple different ways that people have approached talking about the connection between disability and health. Um, and a lot of times uh, in both directions, the connection tends to be a little bit oversimplified. So a lot of times if we're talking about um, disability, the way it's typically understood, I think a lot of times people think of disability just as a biomedical condition, right? So if you have 
achondroplasia, again, to, to, uh, to use that as an example, the idea would be, okay, well, you, you just have a physical, you just have a genetic disorder. And what it is to have achondroplasia is just to have a genetic disorder. So we can understand, you know, what it is to be a person with achondroplasia just by talking in terms of symptoms, by talking in terms of pathology. And so we think of it just as um, as a disorder. And then um, it seems like we can understand disability just as a way of having reduced health. And so disabilities and illnesses are something that exists along a spectrum um, of you know, ways of having reduced health. But I think um, what a lot of people in the disability community point out is that it's much more complicated than that. So the experience of having a disability is much more than um, a collection of symptoms, a collection of biomedical symptoms. So for my friends um, in the Little People Association of America who were upset about this treatment, like, are there biomedical symptoms uh, associated with their experience of uh, various forms of dwarfism? Yes, obviously there are. Um, and some of them are distressing. Like some of them do experience uh, chronic pain and also there's, you know, there's stuff about their growth plays and their heights and so on and so forth. But what it means to them to be um, a little person involves every single aspect of their life, right? How they navigate the world, how other people react to them, how they react to other people. It involves living in the world as a person whose body turned out different than the way that bodies are supposed to be, supposed to be. Um, and that shapes so much of your social experience of the world. And a lot of people report that there are challenges to that, but there can also be positives. There can be benefits. So um, I was talking to my friend Joe, um, who is uh, a little person, and uh, we were talking some about like positive and negative experiences of um, disability and some of the stuff that he was talking about, like why he thinks that um, overall, you know, he values his experience of being a little person. And he was saying things like, um, it's just allowed him a sense of freedom. Um, it's allowed him a sense of just like, you know, he's, he's always been someone who's a little bit weird. Um, and he's really been able to lean into being weird and enjoy being weird. Cause like, you know, um, he's a little person, he's, he's, he's never gonna be normal. <laughs> when, when normal's not an option, he can just embrace being weird. And he just has this, this kind of joy and this freedom in not having um, the expectation that he ever could be normal. So he can just kind of be himself and he likes that. He also talked a little bit and I, I found this really interesting about how he felt that being a little person um, freed him from some of the more harmful um, norms and aspects of masculinity. Uh, it was easier to be a kind and gentler man if you're a three foot tall man. Um, <laughs> so this is one of the, the funniest things uh, that I've heard him say. He also talked about just like norms of the body and things. And he said, yeah, it's just like, you know, why would I care if I have a six pack? I'm three foot tall. Um, it's just like, it's just the kind of thing he just doesn't feel any pressure for. Um, as he goes around in his life. So these are the kind of things that he's talking about when he's talking about his experience of the world. And he also talks about how sometimes like he feels like he challenges people's expectations and he learns a lot from how people react to him and it's like just seeing his body and reacting to his body. Um, and that's something that he really values and he, he wouldn't wanna be without. His wife is also a little person. Um, they have normal sized children. And so they have this very you know um, blended and unique family. Um, and none of this is anything that he would change. And so the idea, he thinks that you could just understand what it's like for him to be a little person, who's one of my dogs, um, just by understanding, you know, the symptomatology um, or, the, you know, the, the aspects of the biomedical pathology um, related to his particular form of dwarfism is something he thinks like that, that's one part of the picture, but it's so much more than that. Um, so these kind of observations have led some people in the disability rights movement who embrace something called the social model of disability, which is that like there's impairments, which are biomedical conditions, but then like disability itself is created by uh, disadvantage, by social disadvantage. Um, 
I won't go into the nature of the social model. Um, I think the social model is, is an over, oversimplification, so I won't go into, into that here. Um, but some people have tried to argue because they think that the, the biomedical model or the medicalized model is, is too simple, that, that basically we shouldn't understand disability as a health condition at all, right? Disability just has nothing to do with health. Disability is about um, access. It's about accommodation. It's about people's social experience. And it's just not a health issue at all. It's not a medical um, issue in any way. Um, so you can understand what people are pushing back against when they make claims like this. They're pushing back against the idea that you know, you could understand what it's like to be a little person living in America just by understanding, you know, the biomedical symptoms associated with achondroplasia or something like that, like that. and it, it, that it's so much more than that. Um, it's so much more than um, a certain set of symptoms or a certain set of biomedical experiences. Um, and that's not what people are talking about when they talk about their experience of disability. Um, but on the other hand, it seems like quite obviously there is biomedical pathology associated with most, with most or all of the things that we label disabilities. Um, and that's part of why they are so socially significant. Um, and I think it's important not to deny this and not to simplify this away. Like there, politically as well as just, you know, describing reality correctly. There's a reason why um, healthcare and access to healthcare is at the center of the disability rights platform. And that's that disabled people as a group have a greater need for healthcare. Um, they are more vulnerable when healthcare is taken away. Um, they're more likely to die when healthcare is taken away. They're more likely to suffer when healthcare is taken away because they have more health needs. Um, and they have distinctive health needs. They also have needs for long-term care, long-term assistance, um, for uh, accommodation and assistance of uh, devices. And all of this is related to, um, in some cases, the distinctive biomedical uh, pathology of their condition. I also think um, sometimes saying that uh, disability is a social issue and not a health issue um, involves a artificial distinction between the biological and the social that I don't think exists. I think that, you know, we are biologically by our nature, social animals. And uh, there isn't typically a distinction between like the social aspects of a person's disability and the biological aspects of a person's disability. They are, they are deeply embedded. Um, so a good friend of mine uh, has MS. Um, and some of what he deals with is uh, he has reduced uh, fine motor coordination in his hands. And so it's the, uh, you know, his everyday frustrations are things like it takes him longer to uh, do everyday tasks like making his breakfast in the morning or buttoning up his shirts in the morning. And so like, you know, he, he has to budget more time for everything than he used to because it takes him longer to do all these things. Um, is that a social uh, phenomenon or a biological phenomenon? Yes, I think is the answer that you're like, it is, it is both. It is obviously a, an embedded part of his social life. It's like, this is his, daily routine and it's a you know contingent social fact that we wear shirts with buttons on it and things like that um but it is obviously due to the biological nature of his condition that he has uh you know he has a demyelinating disease and that has caused him to have reduced um fine motor coordination in his hands um and so this directly impacts what he can do in his activities of daily living uh, you know his 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 experience of his social reality. And I think there's not a clear differentiation between these two. Um, and it seems to me that we need some kind of view of the relationship between disability and health, where disability isn't just a health condition, it isn't just um, a collection of symptoms or, or the same thing as illness or biomedical pathology, but it is also clearly correlated with biomedical pathology in a way that um, other minority features or socially salient categories might not be um, in a way that makes disability quite distinctive um, and distinctive for what we might want to say um, about its connection to well-being. Um, 
it's of course important, I think, in thinking about the connection between disability and health, that it's not obviously the case that all disabled people um, are less healthy than non-disabled people, right? There are um, disabled people that run marathons and uh, climb mountains and play murder ball and do all these, you know, insane levels of sport that are probably much healthier on most of our, most any um, metric of, uh, of physical functioning, probably much healthier than your average person. But it seems that almost all of the features that we consider disabilities are reductions in health, at least along some dimension. Um, and that is really significant for how we think about the nature of disability. You know, if you're gonna say, there's nothing wrong with being disabled, or as a lot of people in the disability pride movement say, like disability is a natural part of human diversity. Disability is something we can take pride in. It's something we shouldn't obviously try to cure. It is very significant that disabilities involve reduced health and they do involve biomedical pathology because we don't want to embrace biomedical pathology. We don't want to embrace um, reductions in health because that seems to lead us down a road that isn't very uh, stable or <laughs> politically sustainable. Um, it seems to lead us to, to saying all kinds of bad things. Um, and it also just like the political fallout of that seems to be disastrous, right? Like imagine, um, you know, if, if people from the disability rights movement went over to like Flint, Michigan or something like that and found the little kids that had been, um, you know, had their health uh, decimated by the water crisis and just, you know, gave them a lot of pamphlets about disability pride and were like, don't worry, it's fine. You know, your health has been reduced, but you've not been made worse off. You've been made merely different. Um, that's not a good look. That's not, no one wants to do that. Um, so the question is whether what the kind of attitude that the disability rights movement has about disability um, is sustainable, given that we want to say that health is good. Um, and the health is valuable. And um, I think it is, um, but I think it involves saying that sometimes um, two people can have radically different perspectives on the same thing um, and they can both be kind of right about it. Um, so let me try to sell you on that idea. Um, First off, I will give uh, a classic philosopher's puzzle. Um, and this puzzle might strike you as uh, somewhat dumb if you're a more practically oriented person, but this is actually the kind of thing that philosophers um, spend an inordinate amount of time uh, worrying about. Um, so this is a, a classic philosophical puzzle um, called the statue and the clay. Um, and the idea is we sometimes find ourselves in situations where we seem to have a single object. And what we want to say is true about that object seems to shift depending on how we view it. And sometimes that pushes us to want to say weird things like there's, there's actually two objects here or something like that. So um, suppose that I have a beautiful statue. So suppose I have a um, replica of the thinker or something like that, and I'm holding it here and it's made out of clay. Um, so I have this beautiful statue and it's made out of clay. Um, and then I ask a very simple question. I say, could this object survive being squashed? And it seems like the answer to that question depends on how I'm viewing it, right? If I am viewing this object as a statue, then I want to say, no, it couldn't, right? If, I've, if, 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 if this is the thinker um, and I squash it, it's not the thinker anymore. It's just some lump. Um, and everything that made it the thinker, everything that made it interesting, um, as an aesthetic object, as a work of art, has to do with its form, has to do with how it was shaped, how it was molded, its artistic history, its, its aesthetic properties. And I would just destroy all of those if I squashed it. So no, it couldn't survive being squashed. If instead I'm thinking about it as a material object, just as, as, as a material thing, then yeah, 
like I've got the same lump of clay. Um, if I squash it, if I mold it into a different statue, um, if I break it up into two little bits of clay or like, I've, I've still got the same thing. It's a lump of clay um, and I can do different things with it. And that's the fun thing about clay. Right? Um, so I seem to be able to arrive at different answers to the question, could this survive being squashed depending on how I'm viewing it. And this has led philosophers to say all sorts of different elaborate things. Like really there's two things here. There's a statue and a clay or there's a statue that's constituted by clay or that actually, so people do all sorts of gymnastics here. Like maybe the lump of clay goes out of existence and the statue comes into being, but then the statue would go away once you smash it and the clay would come back or all of which seem relatively bananas. <laughs> I mean, you actually look at it, it's like, no, there's just, there's just this one thing here. I've just got this one statue and it kind of seems like, I want to say different things are true of it if I'm a person who's, you know, a geologist that's interested in the material properties of matter, or if I'm an art dealer, um, and different things might be appropriate. And so the philosopher David Lewis takes this line on the puzzle of the statue in the clay, and he says, yeah, look, different, there's just, there's just one object here. There is a statue, it's made of clay. There's a statue clay thing. There's just one object. But what is true of the object depends on the context in which you're viewing it. Um, so you might be viewing it in the art dealer context, you might be viewing it in the geologist context and different things are going to be true of one and the same thing, um, depending on how it's being viewed. Um, so I think something like this insight from the puzzle of the statue and the clay might help us to think about um, what's going on in the case of disability and the relationship between disability and health, disability and uh, biomedical pathology. So before we talk about disability, I actually want to um, think another useful case to think about in which I think something relatively similar is going on um, might be the case of aging. So um, aging, not unlike disability, is the kind of thing that we can view from a strictly biomedical lens or from a more broadly uh, social lens where we care more about like the well-being of the whole person, um, the person as they're embedded in their social context, when we're talking more broadly about quality of life, um, about a person's you know, overall projects and life, life satisfaction and happiness versus we're just talking about um, the biomedical status of the human organism. Um, and the thing is, when we're talking about the biomedical status of the human organism, the process of aging just is the death and decay of the human organism. That's all it is. That's just, you know, from around age 20 to 25 or thereabout, we just start to break down slowly over time. And that's what happens to us if we're lucky. Um, and so we have this gradual process of, um, decline in function. And it seems like if you're just looking at that from the perspective of the biomedical lens of what happens to the human organism, then it makes all kinds of sense to say, we should do everything we can to try to slow that down and stop it and kill it with fire if we can, right? It's just, that's the kind of thing that absolutely the institutions of medicine should be interested in trying to minimize, um, slow down, retard as much as they can, because like, what is that? That's just, that's just the decay and the decline of the human organism. At the same time, I think the very same process, the process of aging, if we view it from the lens of people embedded in their communities, people embedded in their lives, their overall quality of life, their overall flourishing, it makes a lot of sense to say, hey, we should calm down about aging. We should relax about aging. Um, we need to destigmatize aging. Um, that actually we tend to overvalue youth and we tend to assume that the best years of like that, you know, the younger you are, the better things are going and the best years of your life are when you're youngest. But in fact, when you talk to people, that's not obviously true, but often 
a lot of our empirical research suggests that there's kind of this U-shaped curve to life satisfaction. Um, that people have a dip in life satisfaction in midlife, but that they actually get happier and more satisfied as they get older. Older people tell us a lot of things about um, aging that they value, um, that are positive associations um, to getting older. Um, we need to work against the way that we prioritize uh, youth and beauty and also all sorts of things in our society that are kind of gross. And especially when it comes to how we talk about aging with women and women's bodies and all this, like we need to embrace aging. We need to um, treat aging as you know something that is a beautiful part of human life and we need to value our elders and aging's fine everybody calm down about aging um i think both of these things are true at the same time um from the perspective just of thinking about the biomedical process of the human organism stop it slow it down it's pathological it's awful it's you going on a slow train to death um, try to try to stop it as, and mitigate it as much as you can. On the other hand, viewed from the perspective of a person's well-being, a person's integration into like the broader quality of life, flourishing integration in society, embrace it. It's great. I love getting older. <laughs> getting older is amazing. You couldn't pay me to be twenty again. Um, and I think both of these things can, both of these perspectives are legitimate and both of these perspectives can be true at the same time. And then it's maybe just a question of which perspective is it appropriate to employ at which time, um, which is the better or more helpful perspective to employ in which context. And there might be some cases in which neither perspective is the better or more helpful perspective um, to take on in a context. Um, but it certainly seems like, you know, um, if my dad uh, who's getting older um, and he's a runner and so he's having uh, a lot of hard time uh, in uh, sort of, he's, he's having issues with his knees, um, continuing to support him as he's a runner, as he's older. And so it would be really annoying if he went to his physical therapist um, and talked about his problems with his knees and the person was just like, well, let's all embrace the beauty of aging, right? That's not helpful. That's not why he went to his physical therapist. At the same time, it totally makes sense that my dad would both go to a physical therapist to get help for his knees and say things like, you know, it's actually been really helpful for me to, my dad's not like a hyper-competitive person. Um, and he's talked about how it's been helpful for him to actually be forced to slow down a little bit and not be able to um, always push himself constantly. And that that's been a valuable thing for him about the process of aging. I think both of those can be true at the same time. They're not necessarily both true in the same context. They're not necessarily helpful things to say in the same context. Um, so I think something similar might be true about disability. Right? In the case of aging, we just got one process here. There is just the aging of the human organism, right? I'm a materialist about this. I think there's like there's not a difference between persons and their bodies. Persons just are their bodies. We just are human animals. Um, there's just one process here, but there might be different things that are true of it depending on the context. And there might be different norms that are appropriately applied to it depending on the context. I think maybe something is similar in the case of disability. So if we are just talking about the function of the human organism, in a biomedical context, then a lot of times it does make sense to talk about the things that we typically think of as disabilities as biomedical pathology. And then it makes sense to say, how do we mitigate this? How do we treat this? How do we uh, try to minimize the harms? How might we prevent things like this from occurring? And I think that makes a lot of sense from a biomedical context. On the other hand, if we're thinking about people's lives, people embedded in their community, people's overall quality of life, um, how people are, if people experience the world and are situated in their community, then it might make sense to go to the disability pride parade, right? And say, this hasn't made my life worse. There's been a lot of things about this that I value. I wouldn't want to be any other way. Um, I don't necessarily think that this is something that's made me worse off. And I think that, you know, 
the kind of experiences that we have with this kind of thing um, are a valuable part of human diversity. They're telling us something interesting about the human experience. Um, I think both of those things might be true at the same time. They might just like the art dealer and the geologist might be different and conflicting perspectives on the same functional state of the human organism. <laughs> Again, I'm a materialist. There's not a difference between persons and their bodies. There just is the one bio, the biological state of the human organism. There might be a different normative context that we can apply um, to thinking about one in the same thing. So what I think is interesting is that, you know, even people, you know, who go to the disability pride parade, they're still going to go to their physicians a lot of time to seek out treatment. And what it would be super annoying to have is if, you know, you say like you've had some new complication or if you have a condition that's degenerative, you know, something new is going on or um, you need regular maintenance. And if your physician just said, well, you know, disability is natural part of human diversity and, uh, you know, it's compatible with a fully flourishing life. So uh, embrace it, just go for it. That's, that would be annoying if your doctor said that um, because that's not the typical role that we ask for physicians to do. That's not the, um, that's not the angle that we ask physicians to take. We typically ask physicians to look at, um, you know, the functioning pathological or normal of the human organism and to address that. And we don't necessarily ask physicians to look at a person's overall socially embedded quality of life. We just, we ask them to look at functioning. Um, and at the same time, it often bothers disabled people when they're out in their community, when they're you know at the disability pride parade, when people just come along and say something to the effect of, um, when they impose a biomedical perspective and they say, like, you know, oh, well, you, you don't function appropriately. You don't function normally. So your life must be worse. Or, you know, um, the, I think the thing that, that disabled people uh, encounter all the time is something like, oh, well, you know, is, is, is there a cure? Is there a cure? We'll, 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 we'll pray for you. We'll, um, in ways that just seem not to take seriously the idea that disabled people's lives are often very rich and very good and very, um, and it would be like saying to, you know, an older person who's living their best life and doing great, like, don't you wish you were still 20? Well, not obviously for some people. Yes, I'm sure. But for some people, no. Um, and it's often, it can, it can be insulting, um, to, say things like that, um, it can devalue a person's experience. And that's a lot of times what, what disabled people um, report when they're talking about their own experiences and their experiences of quality of life. So I think both of these perspectives have their place and have their moment. When things get really hard is when you have uh, debates in which people are just employing different perspectives, right? So um, like, should the FDA authorize a treatment for a chondroplasia? And you have one group employing this very like socially embedded perspective and another employing this very biomedical perspective. And it seems to be a clash of norms. Um, so, and I'm talking as though there are just two perspectives here. In reality, there's going to be, you know, there's also the perspective of public health. What do we do about the fact that um, there are scarce resources here? Um, that, you know, people like me might have very high levels of quality of life, but we're expensive. <laughs> it is, um, there's not in the world that we live in um, enough healthcare to go around. And that's one of the things that matters to, uh, to thinking about these conversations. So there's, you know, there's a public health, public policy perspective. Um, there's a, you know, individual flourishing, individual well-being perspective. There's a biomedical um, clinical perspective. Like all of, all of these might have importantly different norms and be importantly different um, things that we need to think about. And sometimes you do just get a clash of perspectives. Um, I think a classic case of this would be, um, I'm sure the case that many of you have heard about before, uh, for example, like deaf parents who want to select for um, deaf children. Um, and physicians who are appalled by this and think that it's uh, like, how could you possibly do this? Um, I think 
one thing that's difficult about the kind of framework that I'm um, presenting here, if you go back to the statue in the clay case, you might, you've you got this, uh, you've got this clash of perspective, clash of context. You've got an art dealer saying, you know, don't squash the statue, it couldn't survive it. And you've got the geologist saying, squash the, st squash the statue if you want, of course it would survive it. And the thing is, both perspectives might be appropriate perspectives to apply depending on the context. Like one is more appropriate in a museum, one is more appropriate in a science lab, but there might also be perspectives where it's not clear what the, like each is saying something that makes sense according to the norms that they're applying. And there might, you know, if, if you've just found the statue in the wild or something like that, um, it's not clear which perspective is better. Um, on the model that I'm presenting, it's not like there's any God's eye view according to which we can say, you know, whether the statue really can survive being squashed or whether it's like, no, do you just have to figure out which of, which of these norms works better for you in which context and in some cases these questions might like this might just be a way of diagnosing why debates seem intractable um and why debates are particularly hard but it doesn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily be a way of saying who's right or who's wrong um there might be some debates that are just particularly intractable because they involve clashes of norms uh where people are using perspectives that make sense for them and that are appropriate for them, um, but are gonna give very, very different takes on an issue. Um, sorry, I'm like sitting next to this window and I'm, I'm trying not to look like I'm, I've got a glowing glob of light behind me, but there's nothing I can do. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I think that's a decent amount of content to have thrown at you guys. Um, and uh, I, will, I will leave it for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the light glow. It's very um, like something like a halo or something. Um, so that was amazing. We've already got some questions. I, I do want to take moderator's prerogative, which is, um, you know, one of the best parts of this job. And so I, I thought it might be worth it to make sure that I have uh, the kind of structure of what you're arguing correct, and it, it might also be helpful for other folks who are trying to formulate questions. And so the preamble is to make sure I got it right, and then I have a question that's really badly formed that you might be able to give some direction to. Um, so I think what you did is you gave us this tension, right, that um, health disparities are things that we want to be able to say are bad and disabilities and have this non-accidental correlation with reduced health as part of what it means to be disabled. Um, but now we're stuck trying to hold these two different sorts of views that um, my disability doesn't need to be cured. and It's kind of offensive to suggest otherwise, but also my disability is like a medical pathology that somebody in the community, medicine or, or health should be trying to to fix, I'm not quite sure what goes there, fix, cure, treat, make, make better. Um, and so there's this really cool move that you make with the, the philosopher's puzzle. Um, so we have the clay and on the one, one way of looking at the, the clay statue is that trying to say what it really is, is just unhelpful, right? So is it a statue or is it a lump of clay? Um, we need we need to be able to say like with different perspectives with different contexts we say different things and so aging is supposed to be really example a good example of this and it's very funny because as you were talking I said the exact thing that you said a few minutes later which is like oh yeah I tell people all the time you could not pay me enough to be twenty again <laughs> like this is this is real talk about aging um, so I found that very very compelling okay so I'm totally on board and. So the payoff is something like we need to be able to talk about both the bio biomedical and social facts when it comes to disability. And some folks like docs and nurses are gonna be obviously preoccupied with, with the biomedical ones, but if we're at a parade, like talking about you know celebration of our life and um, our way of living, then that is a very different context. Okay, so if I've got it all right, here's my super ill-formed question one way of talking about the puzzle or the tension that you started with was to say disability has this kind of uncomfortable relationship with health 
because we want to some ways sometimes like reclaim disability, but we never want to like disclaim health. That's a terrible bit of language, but like, it feels like we want to say health is a good, which is one of the reasons that you know, health disparities are bad. And so I guess I haven't quite yet figured out how this helps us if what we really were reaching for was like an actual conceptual claim that like health is good deeply and truly and essentially from a God's eye view or whatever. Um, do we actually get that? Or, or is, is the flip side of what you're saying that we're actually gonna have to have that context conversation about health just like we do about disability. So that was my very badly formed question, but if you have uh, ways to make it clear, I'd love that. No, 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 no. So, so I think, um, I think, and I, I didn't address this in the talk, so I think you're right that I just I didn't bring this up, but I, I think the view that I end up being attracted to is that I think there are plenty of things. So I, I think the social perspective when we're talking about disability is just how like this can be a valuable thing that's embedded in someone's life. It can be a valuable part of, 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 a, of a rich and flourishing life. Um, and I think a lot of things that are a, like a lot of the richest and most important parts of our well being are kind of like a mixed bag when it comes to well being. Like most of the things that are most interesting when it comes to quality of life are rarely like univocably good. Um, so like I, I myself am not a parent, but I, uh, I know plenty of people who are parents and very rarely have they reported to me that like parenting is just universally increasing their quality of life. <laughs> it's usually like they will, they will, my, my typical experience of talking to parents, especially of young children, is you ask them, like, how is it going? And you just hear, like, dispatches from the wars, right? It's just like, like, I haven't slept in three years. And, like, here's 47 stories that involve, like, poop and vomiting and, like, stress and, like, the decline of one's sense of self and time. And, uh, and then I was just like, so how is it overall? And they're like, it's amazing. It's the most important. <laughs> it's just like I feel like okay, so you get it, right? There might there might be things. I think a lot of times the things that are like the richest parts of our lives are also things that come with some costs. And so I think when it comes to disability, there might be some things that come with costs, but you don't necessarily have to say in what respect they're um, they're like compensated for. Um, so I think maybe there, like, there, there are certainly some things that disabled people would be saying like you can't do. Um, so if I, I'm thinking back to the case of a contemplated, I'm talking to my friend Joe and it's like, are there costs to not being average height? Like, sure. But um, I don't think you have to point to any particular thing that like compensates him for not being average height. I think like, uh, Ruth Chang has this picture of well-being where she says that like we can think of well-being as a mosaic and the individual tiles, the individual colored tiles are um, values. And then you just want to build a rich and interesting mosaic, but you can do it with different colored tiles and you can arrange them in different ways. You just have to have enough of a rich and interesting perspective. So it's like, it's like, yeah, he might be missing some interesting colored tiles, but you don't have to say, oh, here's, here's, the, here's the thing that compensates him. I think with loss of health, we do need to be able to say, here is what like, okay, yeah, that is, that is bad. That is bad for you. But it's a bad, it's something that is bad that is made up for in some other part of your life. There's like some other good thing that makes up for um, this thing for you that is bad. That is cool. That is very helpful. Oh, I think, are you, I think you might be frozen. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Yes, right, you're there. I'm back. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, sorry, long story short, I think when it comes to loss of health, there needs to be something, I mean, I think it's not dissimilar in the case of aging, where like, loss of, of health in and of itself is not great when it comes to aging, then we need to be able to point to other things about aging that are good, that sort of compensate for uh, the loss of health, if that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm now going to step back and fulfill my actual role of just being a conduit. So, um, and can vouch for the parenthood thing. Nailed it. <laughs> um, 
So uh, we have a question from Lindsay. I am curious what you think about the problem of the power differential between the views. It seems like one issue is that the pathology view is so often assumed as natural and neutral or as appropriate for all contexts. Any thoughts on ways to work through this issue or increase humility? I think this is a huge issue. And I think it's also a huge issue. I, I do want to say, like, in saying this, I, I don't want to endorse the view that somehow, like, everything that the biomedical perspective says is 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 correct or right. I think there is a lot of ableist bias sometimes in what doctors think about disability or say about disability. Um, I think oftentimes you see this in things like um, assuming that treatments that are normalizing are always the best. So like getting people to, like closer to normal function is best for them rather than getting them to like the best version of non-normal functioning that they could get to. Um, so I think I think that is an issue with the kind of thing I'm saying. I think also um, there is just this huge uh, power differential in that we assume that the bio like the biomedical perspective is the dominant perspective. I think that is one reason why in the disability rights commu community you do often see people saying things that I think are probably stronger than what they actually think. Like I think a lot of times people who say that disability is not in any way, shape or form a health issue don't actually think that's true. They just think it's a politically convenient thing to say to try to combat the more dominant perspective. My concern is that sometimes saying the more the stronger thing might actually be counterproductive because it strikes people as too implausible. Um, it strikes people as, and it, I think, I think if we're going to make progress on some of these issues, we have to be able to di uh, to dialogue with health practitioners and with public health workers and with physicians. And like, this is really, really, really important. And this is a huge part of, of achieving justice for disabled people. And so sometimes if you make the stronger claim, um, it shuts off dialogue in a way that, that I think is, uh, it can be counterproductive. Um, I think, I mean, my optimistic hope for the, the power differential between um, the two perspectives is the, the more the more light we can shine on the social perspective, the better. Um, the more awareness we can create of it, that there are these multiple perspectives, the better. But I, um, I mean that that that's a limited answer, and honestly, I I, I don't I don't really know what to do with that power differential because it's it's very real. Um, so yeah. Fair, yeah. Okay, so we are down to the last couple of minutes. So here's where I mean I'm going to offer you an option. So uh, Jeff Kahn, the institute director, has weighed in, and um, he has a since you've already talked a little bit about um, the FDA approval that happened today. There's a kind of narrow question here about uh, research ethics. So he says, for example, the clinical trials performed included children with a comp. Oh, Jeff just jumped on. Jeff, do you want to do you want to speak yourself? Maybe he's not actually able to. Maybe he was just promoted. But the question is, um, so I'm wondering how that played out in terms of the community participating in recruitment of participants into the trials and put into the research protocol, et cetera. Um, so it's a, a very uh, research ethics sort of question. And if you have thoughts on that, we can go there, but we also have a hand up that we can do something totally different if you don't have a lot to say about the, the research side, so. Um, so the one quick thing that I have to say about that, which I think is just one of the issues here that's very complicated, is that, um, you know, a lot of this research has been done on children. And um, one of the very difficult things about disability and thinking about disability as a social kind is that it's a an instance of something that um, the psychologist Andrew Solomon has called a uh, horizontal identity rather than a vertical identity. So Solomon distinguishes between these things that was like, are like parts of our social identity that we get from our parents and which in effect our parents kind of understand what it's like to be a person with that kind of thing um, and have expectations for what they would want for us. So a difference between um, being, you know, being Jewish or being, you know, a particular ethnicity or particular religion, a particular race, where more often than not, if you are that thing, your parents are that thing as well. And they can teach you how to be that thing and they can form expectations for you for being that thing. And there's a difference between that and being disabled or being queer or being these where most often, you know, most often people who are queer are born to straight parents. Um, most often people who are disabled are born to um, non-disabled parents. And so not only can your parents 
not really understand your experience, not really help you learn how to be that kind of person in the world, but also it might really interrupt what they wanted for their child or what they hoped for in their child in a way that, you know, it's not necessarily blameworthy on this their part, but, you know, we I think a lot of people just want kids that are kind of like them and that had lives that are kind of like them and that that can be a little bit pernicious. And I think that does affect the research ethics here to some extent. Um, that's a place that we need to be especially cautious, I think when we're thinking about this, oftentimes we're just talking to the parents, but we also really need to be talking to the communities of adults with these conditions to ask them, like, what do they think? Now Now that there's somebody who's grown up with this condition, what would they have wanted to have happened to a child version of themselves? I think that's a really important perspective to be involved in this kind of thing. Excellent. That did take us to time, and I want to be very respectful of your time and everybody else's. Um, I'm uh, thrilled that we didn't get to everything because I meant there was a lot of excitement. Uh, so we are going to try to collect the chat so that we have a, a record of some thoughts that were raised uh, and we can pass them along and I'll let Joe close this out here. Oh, just um, thank you again, Dr. Barnes for joining us. Um, thanks Travis for moderating and thank you all for attending. Um, we record these and, and archive them on the Berman Institute YouTube channel. So we'll share that link um, as well. Thanks again. Thanks so much for the talk, Dr. Byrne.